Who are you? Human? The way we answer this question will determine the purpose and meaning of our lives. Although it seems the answer is simple, the problem of modern humans is that they do not fully realize what humans constitute. We'll try to answer this fundamental question of existence based on the ancient wisdom of the Vedas. The Vedas are an ancient holy scripture which contain information on all aspects of life. Over time, the Vedas have survived in India, and this has led many people to believe that these writings belong to India. In fact, the Vedas are a universal knowledge. The ancient scriptures on earth, the Vedas, say that human is composed of three main structures, the physical body, subtle body, or the mind, and the soul, which is the source of consciousness. The physical body is the most obvious reality. According to the Vedas, there are four basic needs of a physical body, food, sleep, sex, and defense. We experience a very strong requirement for these needs, and for the sake of bodily comfort, are trying to satisfy them to the fullest extent. To fulfill the requirement of food, there are many facets from which to choose. Food industry, retail chains, stoves, kitchenware, for comfortable sleeping, people try to equip their homes with modern amenities, supplied to them by an ever-changing industry. The third requirement of the body is the association of the opposite sex. To enable this, there are various types of social entertainment, which men and women engage in to stimulate interest in the opposite gender. A Vedic treatise on the subject, Kama Sutra, has acquired a worldwide reputation for its ability to help fulfill the third requirement. Finally, the fourth requirement of a physical body is the need for protection. The physical body and its habitat can be subjected to adverse climatic changes or aggression on the part of the environment. A person may become ill, get injured or fall prey to burglars. Therefore, there is a system of protection and welfare for our body. To achieve this goal on an individual level, door locks, alarm systems, tear gas, pepper sprays and other means of self-defence. On a societal level, there are insurance companies, healthcare frameworks and police protecting us and the army which protects us from external enemies. The better society provides us with these four requirements, the more it is developed from the material point of view. Man does not live on bread alone. He has more subtle needs. Where do they come from? Subtle needs, of course, come from a more fine structure, the subtle body or our mind. What is its requirement? The subtle body needs information, emotions and creative self-expression so people can enjoy freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of creation and freedom of publication. Our subtle body manifests through this self-expression. Sometimes this subtle body is seen as an aura that transcends the physical body. To carry out the needs of the subtle body, there are educational institutions, media, internet, libraries, concert and exhibition halls, theatres, cinemas and clubs of interests. It would seem that an analysis of the physical and subtle bodies can complete the description of a person. Physiology studies the physical body. Psychology studies the subtle body. But is that all that defines a person? Are these all the needs that we looked at? The Vedas say that there are more subtle requirements that come from the depths of the soul, which is more minute than our mental body. According to the Vedas, the soul is the eternal and unchanging aspect of I, 
while the physical and subtle bodies are changing. What are the needs and characteristics of the soul? The needs of the soul are eternity, a comprehensive knowledge and happiness. How then can a product of temporality be desiring of eternality? For example, our physical body may require only those elements which it is composed of. If something inside of us desires eternal life, then this is the true nature of the willing, that is, consciousness. It is the consciousness that is a sign of the soul. The second need of the soul is a comprehensive knowledge. This is different from the mundane, practical and applicable knowledge needed to create material comfort. Spiritual knowledge goes far beyond the everyday material practicality and gives answers to unanswered questions of life, who we are, where we came from, what is the meaning of life. It is that kind of knowledge that the soul needs the most. The third requirement of the soul is the desire to be happy and enjoy in all circumstances. This is evident in every movement of our behavior. We are always looking for a comfortable place, the tastiest food, choosing fashionable and comfortable clothes, listening to nice music, striving to communicate with interesting people, etc. So it goes without saying that everyone is trying to take the best from life. According to the Vedas, this is how our commitment to excellence, which we were once in contact with, unconsciously manifests itself. So these are the needs of a consciousness emanating from the soul. Obviously, they are in conflict with the limited abilities of the physical body. This creates an inner sense of dissatisfaction in life, even in conditions of material prosperity. According to statistics, the highest percentage of suicides are caused by internal discontent. This leads to a sense of meaningless existence, which takes place in the most financially developed countries. Modern science claims that consciousness is the product of highly organized matter, or brain. However, this assertion is debatable. In fact, a highly organized matter itself requires a conscious approach or an intelligent manipulation of matter. Therefore, this definition refutes itself. In addition, none of the chemical elements in our body alone possess consciousness, including the brain cells. No combination of these elements, too, generate consciousness, but, nevertheless, each of us has consciousness. In the language of the Vedas, Sanskrit, consciousness is called by the term Jiva. Another term is Atma, which translates as a spark of spiritual energy or just a soul. Scientists at the International Bhaktivedanta Institute prompted the introduction of a scientific term, spiriton, designating the individual consciousness or soul. It comes about from the English word spirit, spirit soul. This particle of consciousness is fundamentally different from the smallest particles of matter, such as electrons, positrons, etc. The main properties of the spiriton are as follows. 1. It is the bearer of life. 2. Number of spiritons is infinite. 3. Spiriton cannot be created or destroyed. It has an eternal nature. 4. Spiriton has consciousness and free will. 5. Spiriton has a personal nature. Since spiriton belongs to the category of higher energy in contrast to matter, which is of the lowest energy, it does not have material characteristics and therefore cannot be detected by physical experiment. However, there are indirect signs by which we can determine the presence of spiriton in matter. When the matter is devoid of the presence of consciousness or spiriton, it is inert or dead. When spiriton is inside matter, the matter is showing signs of life, just as the inanimate machine is showing signs of life when a person starts it. Matter itself is characterized by a low content of information or the lack of specific external shape except for the atomic and molecular structure. The presence of the spiriton in matter 
fills it with the high, informative content and gives it a concrete and specific form. To see this, just compare the crystal lattice structure of minerals and the extremely complex structure of living cells. The presence of the spiriton in matter runs a clear and regulated mechanism of metabolism which is not observed in inert matter. Inanimate matter tends to lose its shape during transformation, but matter with the presence of spiriton during transformation and regeneration does not lose its complex and specific form. Dead matter cannot reproduce itself, but live matter can. For example, the machine is not giving birth to a little machine. But trees leave seeds behind from which new trees form. The dead matter grows only due to external mass accumulation, but the spirit on inside matter stimulates the growth of matter from the inside, showing the complex process of consciousness development. The crystal is just growing in volume without changing its fundamental qualities, but a living organism is growing, changing its consciousness and passing through such stages as infancy, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, old age. Affected inert matter shows only the passive resistance of the material. The presence of the spiriton in matter creates a mechanism of adaptation to external influences and manifests itself as an active resistance to obstacles. For example, try to hit the ball. The resistance will be only at the molecular level, but if you hit the creature, which has spiriton, it will either run away or will show an active resistance which dead matter is not capable of. When it's cold, we dress warmly. When it's hot, we open windows wide and dress lightly. In this way, spiriton influences us to adapt to the environment. Apart from the fact that consciousness has a nature different from the nature of the physical body, this principle can also be understood by some indirect factors. Naming parts of our body, we say, it is my hand, it is my head, it is my leg, it is my body. We do not say, I, the body. Speaking of my body, we mean that the body has a boss, that is, the soul. When a relative dies, family members exclaim, where did you go? Of course, this assertion implies that the body has been left by someone who was a true person, the owner of the body. Without the consciousness of the soul, the body loses all its value and is either buried in the ground or cremated. An interesting fact is that the chemical composition of the dead and the living body is completely identical. Moreover, death is an instantaneous process and occurs when the lust of the eyes disappears and an oscilloscope fixing electrical oscillations in the brain shows a straight line. If you take the time interval between the moment when a man was still alive and the moment when it was discovered that he was dead, for this insignificant period of time, no change could have occurred at a molecular level, since it would need an infinitely larger energy. The question for scientists is then, why a person has died if at the time of death there had been no changes in the biochemical structure? The only scientific explanation lies in the fact that at the time of death, the body is separated from the consciousness, soul, the true reason for living. Because consciousness is non-material and has no mass, it separates from the body immediately without any use of energy. From then, the process of decomposition of the body starts to progress very rapidly. This is because the consciousness, having an eternal nature, inhibits the destructive processes while still in the body. And when this eternal element leaves the body, there is nothing else to hold back the process of decomposition. The experience of clinical death also confirms the different nature of the consciousness and the body. About 30% of survivors of clinical death remember this experience out of the body and reproduce with great accuracy the events that they observed from a time when their physical body was lifeless. 
This confirms the assertion of the Vedas that the soul is the source of the original senses. These subtle senses of the soul are related to the physical senses through the subtle energy channels in the body. The subtle energy channels at a gross level transform into the nervous system and then are connected to the brain and the external senses. It is these inner senses that allow us to see dreams when our outer eyes are closed. That's how a blind Bulgarian prophetess, Vanga, had seen the future and the apparently deaf Beethoven heard the music. The difference between the soul and the body is reflected not only in the scriptures but also by some scientists. For example, in 1896, professor of Moscow State University, Lopatin, had published an article entitled The Concept of the Soul According to Subjective Experience. The main idea of his work is that within the body there is a subject of perception which captures the physical and mental processes that occur to us over time. The very perception of the passage of emotion or process arises only when the subject of perception is at rest with respect to any process or moving object around it. For example, sitting on the train we feel the motion relative to stationary objects. But if you look at a train which moves parallel to ours at the same speed and in the same direction, the sense of movement is lost. In this analogy, Professor Lopatin states that if our inner consciousness notices the changes of our physical and mental condition, so it has a different nature and is situated beyond time. And since all matter is moving through time, then the soul is not material. Another indirect proof that matter and consciousness have a different nature is that the consciousness is constantly trying to overcome the laws of nature that fetter our freedom. If consciousness was a product of matter, it would have meekly obeyed the laws of the material world, but we are witnessing the opposite tendency. Consciousness is constantly trying to escape from these harsh laws. Science invents a way to overcome gravity, looking for ways to immortality and eternal happiness, which by definition are impossible in the temporary material body. Therefore, between the needs of the soul and the limited abilities of the body, there is a constant contradiction which hinders the full manifestation of the three qualities of the soul, eternity, knowledge and bliss. It is obvious that consciousness has properties different from matter. It is interesting that Lenin's definition of matter indirectly indicates that we, as subjects of mental perception, are different from our bodies. According to this definition, a matter is an objective reality given to us in the form of feelings and sensations and independent of them. If the matter is given to us, we are therefore not part of it. This definition makes sense only if we accept that we, as souls, carriers of individual consciousness, accept the body as a biological suit. There is still an open question as to who gave us these very sophisticated costumes, but more on that later. Thus, the body, mind and soul are in the same relation to each other. Like a hot air balloon, the soul, which strives upwards, a basket, physical body, which pulls down the soul and slings, psyche, connecting a balloon with a basket or the soul with the body. Another example shows how the body is a machine, the soul, which is in the subtle body shell, a passenger. It remains to find out who is the driver of this complex machine. Obviously, this is not the soul. Science is only now beginning to understand how complex the processes of perception, digestion, metabolism, and other such processes are. But these super complex processes are constantly taking place in the body without our conscious participation. How then can such a complex mechanism work without anyone's conscious control? 
To understand this puzzle, we will introduce an additional function, superconsciousness, which is located next to the individual soul and controls the activity of the body. This superconsciousness, or the supreme soul, is the driver of the body. What are the signs of the presence of superconsciousness in the body? Returning to the illustration of the three bodies, we must ask, what keeps the eternal soul within the temporary body? What is the force that puts us in different situations that we cannot avoid? Obviously, we are not completely independent in life. Quite often, some force adjusts our plans. Where does the force of destiny come from? In this diagram, we see that between the physical and subtle body on one side and the soul on the other side, there is a shining personality which is connecting the soul and the body. The Vedas call it the superconsciousness or super soul, Paramatma in Sanskrit. It is due to the presence of superconsciousness in the body that such complex processes as metabolism, digestion and perception are taking place. The superconsciousness is the source of intuition, instinct, inspiration, enlightenment and the voice of conscience. These processes are constantly taking place in our body and psyche, but we do not even understand the mechanisms of these processes, so they are taking place without our conscious participation. But can we find at least one complex and sequential process that would not have been directed by someone's conscious will? The flow of vehicles on the road trade or financial flows are directed by specialists in accordance with certain rules. It may seem to an unsophisticated viewer that all the complex processes in the body happen by themselves, but a reasonable person understands that behind every intelligent and planned process there is someone's intelligence. And if it is not us who directs these processes in the body, then who? Take for example intuition. It is also called the sixth sense. There are five senses in total, sound, touch, sight, taste, and smell. Intuition, or the sixth sense, means that I have not heard, perceived, or seen, but nevertheless, I know or have a feeling that something will happen. Typically, the information gets into our consciousness through the senses, but the word premonition means that we can get the information from the future before the event occurred and penetrate it into our senses. How can this be? The only sensible explanation is that we just get it from someone who is beyond time and has access both to the past and future. This is called supersensible experience or intuition. Interestingly, an animal's intuition works better than the human's. Why is that? Individual animal consciousness is less manifested than of a human, and thus paramatma, or the superconsciousness in the heart of the animal, helps the living being. Just as a parent shares wisdom with a child and directs all his actions while he is small. Animals do not read newspapers and books do not listen to the latest news, and do not get immersed in the endless ocean of the internet. Therefore, they can hear clearly this voice of Paramatma inside, and sometimes they surprise us with their unmistakable premonitions. But humans have a more developed intelligence, and their higher consciousness in the heart gives them more personal freedom, which unfortunately is often misused. Humans' outer channels of perception are overloaded with information and thus they are almost deaf to this inner voice. In December 2004, the coast of Indonesia and Sri Lanka was hit by a tsunami caused by an undersea earthquake. Hundreds of thousands of people died, but among the animals there were no casualties. Two hours before the wave hit the shore, all animals left the coastal strip sensing danger. Under the influence of this higher voice, animals do amazing things at times. Diseased cats without any formal knowledge of botany easily find medicinal herbs. This means that someone knows the healing quality of herbs and the needs of cats and brings them together. 
Usually, people try to explain things like this with a mysterious term called instinct. But if you look up the dictionary, the word instinct is explained as a reasonable impetus coming from within. And what's inside the body except for organs devoid of intelligence? Again, we come to the idea of superconsciousness in the heart. Birds without knowing geography unerringly fly south or north. The ants build complex nests and spiders weave an intricate web that is the epitome of perfect engineering. Bees store honey in hexagonal honeycombs which ideally contribute to conservation. Obviously, such an exact knowledge can only come from a perfect source. The same form of Paramatma or God in the heart is the subject of meditation to a yogi according to the ancient treatise Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. This form is in every atom of creation, hence the complex structure of the atom. Thanks to his pervasive nature, this universal intelligence coordinates karma or the fate of all living entities simultaneously. Now we have a full understanding of what constitutes a person. It is primarily the individual consciousness, the soul, the psyche or the subtle body and physical body. All these structures are linked by energy of Paramatma or the Supreme Consciousness in the heart. If consciousness has an eternal nature and the body is temporary, what happens to the consciousness at the moment of death of the body? According to the energy conservation law, it should not disappear. Where does it go? What body does it get? And why? So here rises a question on reincarnation. Reincarnation is not an Indian belief of transmigration of the soul, but a manifestation of the energy conservation law on the moral and spiritual level. If in this life the soul has attained a certain level of development, it must be preserved, so that the soul would be able to continue the path of perfection in higher forms of life. Similarly, if consciousness is degraded, the lower forms of life must give pain to such a living entity by teaching a lesson of fate, which means that reincarnation formalizes a particular match between a certain level of consciousness and a gross body. It is difficult for people to accept the idea that the soul can get into a new body after death. To help us understand the internal reincarnation, we must look at the external reincarnation, which happens to us every second. What does this mean? This means that we change our bodies multiple times, even during a single lifetime. To see it, just look at photos of yourself over the years. Science says that every seven years, each cell in our body is gradually being replaced by new ones. This is due to metabolism. With each breath, every sip of water, every piece of food, a new matter is ingested into our body and the old matter goes out through the excretory system. This process of constant renewal of cells makes the body like a slow stream. When we look at the river, it may seem like it's the same river, but there is always new water coming from the mountains. Similarly, the full exchange in the fatty tissues of the body occurs every month. The mucosa of the stomach is updated every five days. The skin becomes new every five weeks, etc. Practically, this means that the body, as something permanent, does not exist. But as the changes occur very slowly, we simply do not notice. The flame of a candle too seems to be fixed to our imperfect eyes, but if you look at it with eyes of knowledge, it turns out that at every moment some flames are extinguished and others appear. The impression that I remain the same is only because of the constant nature of consciousness. The flow of material particles of the body wraps around the soul, changing our external shape every few years. This is called internal reincarnation, that is, the change of the body in one life. In fact, the child's body does not look like the body of an adult, and an adult human body is different from the body of a decrepit old man. Thus, the inner reincarnation 
is the observed fact of life for the discerning man. What is the case with external reincarnation? In the ancient Vedic treatise Bhagavad Gita, it is stated the following. Just as the soul in one life passes from the child's body into the body of a young man, and then to the old man's body, and at the time of death it goes into a new body, such changes do not disturb those who have realized their spiritual nature. Thus, an external reincarnation is the process of the same nature as the transition from the child's body into the body of a young man. To see an external reincarnation is quite difficult, but it is sometimes possible. The most obvious example would be a caterpillar, which almost right before our eyes transforms into a butterfly after having spent some time in the cocoon. As for human reincarnation, at the scientific level, there is an American professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia, Ian Stevenson, who has been studying this subject matter for nearly a quarter of a century. He has hundreds of documented cases of reincarnation, which have been scientifically tested. As an example, there is a case of Shukla, a daughter of a Bengali train driver. Her favorite game was to swing a pillow in her arms calling her by the name Mina. The girl related to Mina as her daughter and told everybody about Mina's father and his two brothers. According to Shukla, they lived in the city Batpa and that's why she constantly asked her parents to take her there. Shukla's father found out that in Batpa there really lived a woman named Mana who died several years ago and had a little daughter named Mina. The fact convinced Shukla's father that his daughter was this woman, Mana, in her past life. When the family arrived in Batpa, Shukla unmistakably took everyone to the house where Mana had previously lived. Then, among 30 strangers, she unmistakably recognized Mana's husband, her mother-in-law, brother-in-law, and daughter Mina. All these details have been carefully checked and confirmed. Another case occurred with an American patient of Ian Stevenson, who, in a hypnotic regression state, spoke in an unknown language. This speech has been recorded and played back to linguists. Experts said that it was one of the dialects of Swedish spoken by the inhabitants of a certain area. In this lifetime, this woman had never been to Sweden, did not study foreign languages, and was not interested in the culture of Sweden. This phenomenon, when people begin to speak in foreign languages, which they did not learn in this life, is called xenoglossy phenomenon. The only adequate explanation for this phenomenon is the assumption that in her past life as a soul, the carrier of consciousness, she lived in Sweden. After that, obeying the law of cause and effect, she has received a new body in America. Naturally, the language of her past life has been rendered useless because of having gone into a subconscious state, but under certain conditions it has been activated. Other reasonable explanation of the xenoglossy phenomenon does not yet exist. The Bhagavad Gita compares the reincarnation process with a change of clothing. Just as man discards old clothes and puts on new ones, so the soul leaves the old and worn out body and acquires a new body. The question naturally arises, why don't we remember our past lives? The answer is simple, if we would remember all our past lives, or at least one of them, we would have a personality split. We would not understand who we were and what we needed to do. If you run too many apps on your computer simultaneously, it will freeze because of not having enough memory to cope with them. Similarly, if we are given a memory of all our past lives, we would fall into a stupor. Therefore, the Paramatma, superconsciousness in the heart, gives us only as much memory as necessary for normal functioning of this body. 
Along with the disappearance of our previous body, the memory associated with that body is also lost. However, not all is lost without a trace. Those programs that we have not completed in the past life are transferred into this life and manifest as natural talents in particular areas. According to this factor, we can understand what we did in our past life and what program we have not yet completed. For example, Mozart said that he did not write music, but just remembered it. Already in his childhood, he had revelations of musical compositions. From the perspective of reincarnation, he simply broadcasted the musical experience of his past life. The logic of reincarnation is simple. As today, we continue doing what has not been finished yesterday, remembering about it after an overnight break. Similarly, after death, which is a break between incarnations, we get reminded by Paramatma of what we need to do. The mechanism of reincarnation implies that even in this life, we are modeling our future incarnation by our thoughts, desires and actions. In order to determine the likely vector of reincarnation, that is, if we go up, down or stay on the same level, it is necessary to understand such a concept as the guna, or quality of material nature. The Vedas say that matter which affects the consciousness is multidimensional. According to the Vedas, matter can be present in a combination of three qualities, goodness, passion and ignorance. Literally, the word guna means rope. Ropes are usually used to tie up the rebels. So the soul, having abused its freedom, goes to the place of minimum freedom, imprisonment, where material nature ties it up with unseen forces or gunas, ropes. Also, the modes can be compared to filters which conceal the consciousness of the soul to varying degrees. In the same way, modes can be compared with the three primary colors, yellow, red and blue, which are mixed to form all other colors. The gunas themselves are not visible, but the effect of their influence can be seen in the consciousness. For example, when the mode of goodness affects the consciousness, being the most light and transparent, it hides very little the quality of the soul. Therefore, people influenced by the mode of goodness are interested in spirituality, trying to understand the universal laws of life, seeking purpose and meaning in life. They love to learn and explore the world. They are guided by high moral principles and exhibit qualities such as responsibility, discipline, cleanliness, honesty, gentleness and unselfishness. In their lives they are moved by a sense of duty. The mode of passion is a more dense coating of consciousness and thus people under the influence of this mode are much less interested in spiritual reality and their energy is more focused on matter. Even if they turn to God, they ask Him for only material things such as health, prosperity and success. These people are energetic, ambitious, creative and have lots of plans for the future. They are movers of material progress. They are very happy if they are successful and very upset if they fail. For momentary benefit, they are willing to compromise their conscience or the law. Their main driving factor is selfish desire. Under the influence of the mode of ignorance, people manifest such qualities as laziness, passivity and apathy. These people often lead a sedentary lifestyle. They sleep more than eight hours a day barely awake and hardly motivated. They are often late, it is difficult for them to start their own business, 
It is easier to follow someone else than to take the initiative. They are addicted to intoxication such as alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and it is very difficult for them to give up these habits. They are always dissatisfied with something, like to criticize others, and tend to shift responsibility to others' shoulders. They are prone to idleness and a parasitic lifestyle. The person in the mode of goodness is more interested in self-improvement. The person in the mode of passion is more interested in external activity and he is motivated by a desire to change the world. A person under the influence of the mode of ignorance is not attracted by any activity, neither internal nor external. He prefers idleness and dalliance. He also tends to destroy everything starting with his health and ending with the environment. He gets pleasure from abusing and other destructive activities. Naturally, in its pure form, these gunas are found very rarely. In most cases, these modes are mixed in different proportions and provide a variety of human natures. These modes are dynamic, and that's why a person can change, deliberately increasing an influence of different modes in his life. Sometimes a person degrades, and sometimes, taking advantage of knowledge, willpower and freedom of choice, he rises to a qualitatively higher level of life. These three gunas, or forces of nature, give rise to three main states of consciousness, which a living entity may remain in. Under the influence of ignorance, consciousness manifests a condition called sleep without dreams. It means that a person is not aware of his existence. A human may remain only a short period of time in such a state. Only the simplest living organisms can live in this state for a long time. Under the influence of the mode of passion, Consciousness manifests a condition called sleep with dreaming. It means that we dream that we are someone else than we are in reality. This state of consciousness corresponds to the position of most people. They are eternal souls, but under the influence of the mode of passion, it seems to them that they are temporary bodies. Mistaking oneself with the body is the same as to confuse oneself with a suit one wears or a car one drives. Under the influence of the mode of goodness, consciousness is in a state of awakening. In this state, we begin to understand that we are something more than just a biological machine. At this level, a person clearly sees the difference between a soul and a body and begins to seek spiritual knowledge and the path of spiritual development. However, even this state of awakening is not the highest because if we wake up but don't get up, we can easily fall asleep again. Thus, the Vedas say that the purpose of human life is the elevation of consciousness over all three modes, including the mode of goodness. It is said in the Vedas that our future incarnation is determined by the state of consciousness in which the soul leaves the body at death. For example, if consciousness at the time of death is in the mode of goodness, the soul goes to higher worlds to continue the path of spiritual progress. If a person dies in the mode of passion, he regains the human body to continue to exercise his materialistic plans. If, however, a consciousness of a person is immersed in the mode of ignorance at the time of death, it opens the way to the lower worlds or lower forms of life. In this sense, reincarnation is a perfect tool which gives the soul a chance to live in a variety of bodies and go through a varied experience which allows the soul to gradually get rid of his material desires and seek a spiritual quest. 
The Vedas mention 8,400,000 forms of life that exist in this universe, which represent different combinations of the three modes of material nature. Out of these, 400,000 are human-like forms, from snowmen to people of higher humanoid planets, or angels in the biblical language. What is the mechanism of external reincarnation? How can the soul of the human body go into an animal's body? It begins with the fact that a person in this life can descend to the level of animal consciousness and a new body will consolidate this state of consciousness corresponding to the physical body for the time being. For example, if a person in this life manifests the quality of a predator, uses violence and eats the products of violence, it creates an appropriate mindset and God in the heart or super consciousness gives him the appropriate form in which violence is natural. For an animal such behavior is normal, but for a human it is not. If a person is completely indiscriminative in the diet, he can get a form of life for which this kind of food consumption is more typical than for humans. Those who love to sleep longer than is necessary will be able to carry out their wish in the bodies of sloths, bears or cats, which sleep 70% of the time. Lovers of scuba diving can get fish bodies, and fans of flying can get the body of birds. The person who seeds violence in his life later becomes a victim of violence. For example, the word meat in Sanskrit sounds like mom, sa. Mom means me and sa, you. It carries the idea of cause and effect. Now you're killing me, then I'll kill you. For meat lovers, it is better to switch to soy meat or at least give up the meat of cows, which are the most useful animals for humans and the Vedas regard cow killing as murder. Being in the cycle of cause and effect relationships, we are entangled in the traps of karma which we have created. Exhausting his old karma, a person immediately creates a new one which forces him to get more and more new material bodies. The animals are almost devoid of free will and thus they only experience the old karma, gradually rising again to the human form of life to regain the freedom of choice. The soul in the animal body does not create a new karma, otherwise it would be forever deprived of the chance to rise above. Thus, the Vedas say that the objective purpose of human life is to achieve a fourth state of consciousness above the three modes of nature. It is pure spiritual consciousness which allows to fulfill the three requirements of the soul, eternity, knowledge and bliss. This level is achieved due to the fact that having risen to the mode of goodness, a person does not stop at the proper philosophical understanding of life, but begins to engage in practical spiritual activities, meditation, prayer and service to God. If a person lives in the mode of goodness, he gets the maximum benefit from the material life, since among all material qualities, the mode of goodness is the highest, as well as an accurate perspective of spiritual development. Therefore, this way of life can be called the path of progress. If a person chooses for himself the standard of living in the modes of passion or ignorance, then he cannot get a higher quality of life, even at the material level, and the prospect of spiritual development for him is closed. Just as in ignorance and passion, a person is not able to understand the deep spiritual philosophy and cannot engage in spiritual practice. Therefore, it can be called the path of degradation. In order to help the soul to rise above matter, there are different evolutionary systems in human society. The Vedas call these universal practices by the term yoga, which means relationship with God. In the West, this concept is represented by the term religion. 
Yoga has several stages. The first stage is Karma Yoga, which means that a person is connected with God through his activities, karma, or through his physical body. The second stage, Jnana Yoga, or Sankhya Yoga, means that the connection is through spiritual knowledge or our subtle body. The third stage is Ashtanga Yoga, Eightfold Yoga, a relationship with God through meditation and breath control. The first four stages of this practice are known to us as Hatha Yoga, and four higher levels are referred to as Raja Yoga. Bhagavad Gita proclaims Bhakti Yoga as the highest form of yoga, relationship with God through love and devotion of the soul. This practice includes elements of all previous systems, but surpasses them all because it involves our most profound essence, the soul. The rest of the yoga practices involve only the shell of the soul, the physical and subtle body. Thus, the human body is like a power plant, which is designed to elevate the consciousness. The consciousness of the soul circulates through subtle energy centers of the body, the chakras, which are responsible for specific functions. The lowest chakra, Muladha, is responsible for the accumulation of vital energy and its unrefined form. Its influence in our lives is seen as a hoarding instinct. The second chakra, Svadhisthana, is linked to human sexual function. The third chakra, Manipur, is in the area of the solar plexus or stomach and is responsible for digestion. These three lower chakras are related to human physiology. The fourth chakra in the heart area is called Anahata and it is responsible for emotions, love, compassion and mercy. The fifth chakra is located in the throat at the base of the tongue and is associated with the communicative function of the human ability to speak and articulate thoughts. Sixth chakra, Agya or Agya, is in between the eyebrows and sometimes called the third eye. The highest seventh chakra near the fontanelle at the junction of the three cranial bones is called Sahasrara, thousand petaled lotus which symbolizes the full potential of consciousness, while the lower chakra symbolizes the consciousness in the seed stage. So, a human in his development must go from a complete egoist and a consumer to a giving person, able to devote himself to spiritual service and to surrender himself to God. A relationship with God through love and devotion. This practice affects the heart chakra, the habitat of the soul. Such is the path of harmonization of the chakras from the center to the periphery. The heart chakra is the center and acts as a sort of bridge between the three lower and three higher chakras. Thanks to the spiritual opening of the heart, the lower centers get spiritualized and this is reflected in the fact that demand for food, sex, and the accumulation naturally diminish. The diet tends to become vegetarian and sexual love begins to transform itself into a higher form. As for the higher chakras, the human speech, depending on the condition of the fifth chakra, is cleared of dirty language and becomes more spiritualized. The sixth chakra begins to provide a person with a correct understanding of life. At this level, he is able to not only understand God, but to love Him because his intelligence becomes emotionally charged due to the opening of the heart. Based on this, a person decides to devote himself to spiritual practice in which there is a direct contact with God and all three requirements of the soul, eternity, knowledge and happiness are fully realized. The Vedas postulate the existence of two types of reality, the original, spiritual, and secondary, the material. They relate to each other as an object and its shadow. Although the shadow looks like an object, 
it is devoid of the inner core. For example, a drawn tree can look very much like the real one, but it cannot give fruit, flowers and wood. Similarly, our material world, in all its diversity, is simply a three-dimensional reflection of a multi-dimensional spiritual reality. The spiritual world exists eternally, and the material world, like a shadow, under certain circumstances may appear and disappear at certain time cycles. According to the Vedas, the original home of all souls is the spiritual world, where the center of all relationships is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. God has complete freedom and independence, and He is the source of all energies. The soul, being a particle of God, has only partial independence. In the eternal existence, the soul takes advantage of its partial independence, and then it is forced to leave the spiritual world and go to the material world, where God is not obvious and is present only as the universal consciousness, Paramatma, that controls the laws of the universe. Here, the soul can try to live in relative independence from God. However, nothing can replace God for the soul, and having passed through many rebirths, the soul might get tempted to return to the spiritual world. Then Paramatma from the heart begins to direct the soul where different spiritual paths are practiced. Different spiritual traditions are like the rescue ladder from the spiritual world, which is used by the soul to gradually escape from the material world. So, a human being is a combination of an eternal soul and a temporary material body. The subtle body is the shadow of the soul or the projection of the consciousness of the soul on matter. The subtle body or the materialistic consciousness is the connective tissue between the body and soul. When the subtle body is impregnated with the material conception of life, the soul identifies itself with the body. When we receive spiritual knowledge, the mind and the consciousness gets purified of false identifications and then the favorable conditions for the return of the eternal soul to the eternal world manifest. Otherwise, the eternal soul would be forced to wander forever in the material world, changing bodies like clothes. As a consequence of secular education, consciousness is devoid of the spiritual alternative and therefore a person tends to give preference to the needs of his physical body, ignoring his true spiritual interests. In fact, it means that he is unable to distinguish primary from secondary. He forgets that his body is alive only as long as the consciousness, soul, and superconsciousness, God in the heart, are present. Thus, the soul takes the position of a battery, which nourishes the body. It turns into a car owner, who is only concerned with the machine and forgets about its personal interests. In this case, it turns out that the owner exists for a car, not a car for the owner. It is obvious that the car must be regularly refilled with petrol, but the owner of the car will not drink it. He needs different food. So what is the food for the soul? The soul needs spiritual energy that comes directly from God. What does it mean? It is noticed that the consciousness of all living creatures have one thing in common. It seeks the most attractive manifestations of reality. Of all the environments, we instantly allocate the brightest, most beautiful and attractive. This suggests that consciousness has an innate aesthetic orientation. The Vedas explain that God by nature is the most attractive person and this world is his creation. Therefore, a living entity in its pure consciousness gets attracted by God himself and when the consciousness of the soul is covered with the three modes, he tends to get attracted by his creation. But in any case, God attracts the soul, either directly or indirectly through a material nature. Therefore, the Vedas call God by the term all-attractive, that in Sanskrit language sounds like Krishna. 
Krishna is a name that points to the all-attractive nature of God. How can the soul receive spiritual nourishment from God? The Vedas recommend it in the form of spiritual knowledge, meditation in the form of God, and as a practice of repeating God's names in the form of prayer or mantra. God, having an all-pervasive and absolute nature, is non-different from his names, and therefore his names contain all divine energies. In the current era, the Vedas recommend the Hare Krishna mantra as the most effective remedy. The full text of it reads as follows. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. This mantra is translated as follows. O oh, all attractive Lord, Krishna, O oh, all blissful one, Rama, please accept my service to you. This mantra can be chanted individually on beads and collectively in the form of group chanting. In the process of chanting of this mantra, the subtle body gets purified. As a result, the spiritual enthusiasm of the soul is increased and the material desires weaken. A person can easily get rid of bad habits and create a spiritual value system in which God occupies a dominant position. In addition to the spiritual effect, there are also positive physical changes. In 1996, the University of Florida, Department of Psychology, conducted a scientific experiment to detect effects of this mantra on the human mind and health. After a month of daily chanting for 20 minutes, the experiment in the group of participants revealed that the rate of the mode of ignorance, such as a tendency to depression, attachment to tobacco and alcohol, decreased by 18.5%. The effect of a mode of passion, which manifests itself under stressful conditions, and the like, decreased by 10%. The influence of the mode of goodness, on the contrary, increased by 7%. Many participants felt more confident in themselves, began to show greater capacity for crisis management. Some got interested in vegetarianism, and so on. This suggests that the Hare Krishna mantra has a positive effect on people, regardless of their beliefs and religion. In conclusion, we can say that spiritual development is possible and necessary for all people. It is possible because we are all spiritual beings, and until we realize our spiritual program, we will not be happy. Our lives will be incomplete despite all the material achievements. Spiritual life is necessary because if a person does not prepare himself for the spiritual future, then he is unconsciously preparing himself for the inevitable crisis of values. The dynamics of life is that with age, the ability to enjoy through the physical body is reduced since the senses of the body weaken. Therefore, People should prepare themselves for the transition to alternative sources of happiness that are not related to matter. Spiritual life is a natural and safe haven for the soul, which is inevitably getting closer to the moment of exiting the body. If you are interested in Vedic culture and philosophy, we recommend you refer to the books of Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada published by the BBT, or visit the nearest Hare Krishna Center.